Um, it depends what you want to do. So there is an exercise in this where we go into the details, you know, about the counting of the edge bar dimension. And there is another one, yeah, maybe more about you know, the quantum numbers of the quark and the left hand in the standard model. <coughs> so you consistently check about uh, the gauge anomalies, the constellation of the gauge anomalies. If you have never done it, it's quite interesting. Um, there is also the question of, of, of the quantization of, uh, of the charge. So at the end of the day, in the standard model, you have one uh, non-abelian component of the gate group, which is U1. And um, there is always a problem, how do you fix the charge of U1, right? I mean, there is no canonical normalization of a U1 charges. And at the end, it boils down why the L, at the end of the day, the, um, the proton is electrically neutral, right? Why? the charge of the quark is exactly equal to minus or two-thirds the charge of the electron, right? Uh, it seems a mystery. Uh, to some extent, it can be explained by a requirement of uh, the anomaly constellation. It's not totally true, actually, if you impose, if you introduce a right-handed neutrino, uh, then you don't necessarily explain why the quark has a, a charge which is minus two-thirds the charge of the electron. That still remains an open question if you introduce the right hand So if you have never done this exercise, please do it. You will learn something too. It's basic stuff. Um, okay, so another exercise is about the row parameter. So you know we computed the row parameter with a doublet on the SU2. And we found that rho is equal to one. So you can actually generalize this. Um, this computation of the row parameter, you're assuming that you have um, a, a set of uh, representation is of spin S under the SU2 symmetry with hypercharge Y, and you get this uh, general expression for the row parameter. It's again something that you will learn you know, about group representation. Um, yeah, so an exercise about X uh, self-coupling, so I think we have done it many times already by expanding, you know, this X potential, you get a prediction for the cubic and the quartic X self interaction in terms of the two input parameters of your X potential, which is the quartic coupling and the bed, which at the end of the day are fixed by the Fermi constant and the X mass. So this means that you have, you have two predictions. You predict that the X self coupling and the quartic coupling as a function of these two input parameters. And one of the big experimental questions is actually to verify those, those standard model predictions. And how to modify actually this prediction by adding, for instance, higher dimensional operator in the X potential. Um, another thing that they discussed was um, WW scattering. You know, I told you that we want uh, the amplitude, let's say, to, to remain smaller than one, right? to be consistent with perturbative unitarity. So the way people really derive this unitarity bound is through this partial wave decomposition. So you have an amplitude that you decompose in partial wave, this coefficient AR, that are just pure numbers. And let's say unitarity of the S matrix imposes that actually the real part of this partial wave is smaller than one half. From this relation, you can now derive actually exactly this uh, unitarity bound. First on the scale, you know, at which you lose perturbative unitarity without the X boson, or the perturbativity bound on the mass of the X boson. So that's again something that belongs to, to the history of physics. Um, maybe we can spend some time here about this coleman weinberg potential, which is a, a, a neat way, actually, to compute these quadratic divergences and reproduce the computation that we have done this morning of these quadratic divergences. So the advantage of you know, using this coleman weinberg potential is that you will have uh, some more algebraic expression directly for the quadratic piece. You know, it will be the super trace of the mass matrix. So something you, know, you don't need now to, to compute every time some, some loop diagrams, etc. You can just look at the spectrum and automatically check whether or not you have quadratic divergence in your model. So this will impose also some mass relation between the different particles, you know, if you want to cancel uh, the quadratic divergences. So we can spend some time really 
deriving those expressions, we see that it match very well with the, with the loop diagrams. Uh, this is an exercise that I didn't have time to prepare. I wanted to discuss a little bit uh, what the form of the, of the potential in composite X model. Um, I discussed briefly, I think it was here, the, this oblique parameter, this S and T parameter, which is just modification of the propagator of the W on the Z. So, you know, how do you really see the physical effect of this uh, oblique parameter? So, this is just a modification, you know, uh, of some observable in the electric sector. A modification of the W mass predicted as a function of the Z mass, alpha electromagnetism, and G Fermi. So, in the standard model, you know, if you, you have three parameters, which are basically the two gauge coupling plus the, uh, the X wave, right? So you can determine those three input parameters in terms of three observable, which is alpha electromagnetic, F alpha electromagnetic, G Fermi, and MZ. And then you get a prediction of any other observable. So in, pr in principle, you can also predict the mass of the W once you know this free input parameter. So now, in general, in BSM, you would get some deviation from this standard model prediction. And one parameterization of this deviation is in terms of this oblique parameter, which is called, often called ST or U parameter, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and epsilon 3. So this is uh, the standard um, formalism. And now I wanted to, to compute explicitly those, those expressions you know, in terms of higher dimensional operators. So for T, so this is the T parameter, this is the S parameter. Okay, we can do this exercise. Um, yeah, so yesterday I was mentioning this field definition, you know, that you have to do. To absorb those nonlinear derivative interaction in presence of this dimension six operator, okay. so say that you introduce this operator, and this in particular contains h squared plus v squared plus h squared d mu h squared. Right? And I told you that you can actually absorb this nonlinear derivative interaction by a field definition, so h plus h squared plus h cubed is h tilde, right? in such a way that this term will write actually d mu h tilde. So this is exactly what is done in this exercise. That's the field definition. Um, one thing that I didn't discuss so far is about um, the running of the gauge coupling. So this morning, for instance, uh, we saw the evolution of, um, of the quartic of the quartic X coupling as a function of the energy. Um, what is maybe more familiar is actually the running of the gauge coupling with the energy. So G1, G2, G, G prime, and G QCD are function of the energy, and and the running is actually very much dependent on the particle content. So once you know the particle that exists in the standard model, you can compute actually how uh, this, this gauge coupling evolved to the energy. So this is the generic formula that was maybe derived for the first time, but again, by Gross and Vilcek. In particular, this is a relative minus sign you know, for the spin one compared to the other. So for non-abelian interaction, you can have really an asymptotically free series, so the beta function uh, will be positive or negative depending on your sign convention. So there is various things. So you can compute this running into the standard model and check whether or not you have a unification of the gauge coupling. You can repeat the same exercise in the MSSM, in the minimal supersymmetric standard model. And then I added a nice exercise also about n equal 4 supersymmetry to show that here at least at the, at the one loop level, the beta function is vanishing for the particle content which is predicted by n equal 4 supersymmetry. So that's the first indication that maybe n equal 4 is actually a conformal, a conformal field theory in four dimension. That's an interesting, an interesting exercise. If you have never done it, check it explicitly. Um, and an exercise that probably um, something that I will discuss tomorrow which um, that will also be covered in, a, in the extra-dimensional lecture is actually um, 
the space time in presence of a negative cosmological constant. So what is the solution of Einstein equation in presence of a, a negative cosmological constant? So it will curve the space. And the, mag uh, the background won't be Minkowski anymore. It will be what is called anti sitter space, so ADS space. And this is really uh, how to derive the metric of anti sitter space, or so how to solve the Einstein equation in presence of the negative cosmological constant. If the cosmological constant is positive, then the metric is called uh, de sitter space, and it, it is what it describes uh, inflation. So inflation is driven by a positive cosmological constant. So that very similar metric to this. And then this is related to, uh, to the randall sundrum model. So randall sundrum model is one extra dimension that has a geometry of anti de Sitter. And then we will see that there is uh, some nice gravitational effects, so some redshift. All the scales you know, in the problem are redshift by, by the curvature of the space line. And that's one solution of the hierarchy problem. And the nice things of this uh, Randall syndrome model is that it gives you an extra dimensional um, dual description of some strongly interacting series. So, for instance, this SO5 over SO4 model that I was describing, you know, which is in principle really a four dimensional strongly interacting series, can, can be described by weakly coupled uh, physics in five dimensions in this anti de Sitter space. And we will see the, the correspondence between you know, the physical quantities and uh, the symmetry of the models. So I don't know how you want to proceed. Um, this has an exercise. We can pick one and solve it together. Or maybe one of you can go on the blackboard and it will help you solving this, these things. It's up to you. It's really, you are the customers. Just eat it once. Not me. Not you. No, no, no. <laughs> Somebody, a volunteer. You can pick up whichever whichever exercise you want. No. Maybe we can. Okay. Maybe we can pick up one for you. Then. Yeah. Why don't we do this for very nice? It will be a nice. It's a compliment to what I discussed this morning. So, any volunteers there? It's just a computation of an integral, right? No? Good. Always right here. But they don't really have any ideas. Uh, I'm not right. supposed to do this. <laughs> so what we want to compute is what is called this effective potential. So you assume that, you know, um, a field like the Higgs boson will take um, a background value which might be different than the true vacuum. Mm -hmm. And the question is basically how much energy does it cost to actually be away from this vacuum. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what this uh, effective Coleman wave potential is giving you. Right? So this is given by this expression. So what we want to do is now we really compute explicitly this potential, you know, this integral, expand in, in, uh, in power of the cutoff, we see that there is one term that can give rise to quadratic divergent uh, correction to the x one. So that's what we want to compute. So you need to compute first this integral, so the integral of uh, the momentum. So here, super trace means that it's a trace over the boson minus a trace over the fermion. Well, it means that you know you have you have a particle content. Mm -hmm. yeah, so this is all the particles that exist in the standard model. Mm -hmm. So you have some boson and you have fermions. Mm -hmm. And exactly like you know, in the statistic versus fermion derives, there is actually a minus sign mm -hmm. for boson versus fermions. So that's exactly what this super trace means. So it's a trace over the boson minus the trace over the fermions. Okay. Oh. Maybe you explain in few words to 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 the old this book. Kuhlman-Weinberg potential is a bit, in a bit more detail. So otherwise, I would guess, do you know what Kuhlman-Weinberg potential is? As I said, I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, as I said, it would be just simply, you know, uh, <laughs> take one plus two. Yes. Would be three. Okay, fine. But well, without understanding what they are doing, you know? I mean, as I say, I mean, this Kuhlman-Weinberg potential is just um, 
computing the amount of energy that it costs to be away from the true minimum of the potential. So H here, you know, is the background value of the X. And you know, if you are away from the true minimum, so this is one loop, uh, one loop potential. So this is really resuming all the quantum corrections. So at one loop, it's telling you how much energy it costs to be away from the classical minimum of the potential. So H will be the background field. So for each value of H, you have um, a particular spectrum for so the masses of, the, of all the particles, the boson and the fermion. So you have the mass matrix that depends on the function of H. And this will give you now a potential that depends on H. And H is really the value of the background field, but potentially away from its minimum. And in graphs like this, yeah, okay. and this is yes. So this will be the point, the one loop quantum correction to this classical potential. Mm. So I mean, the only thing that you need to compute now is really this integral of uh, the momentum. So you compute this integral, you expand in power of lambda, and you get this expression. And now we want to compute explicitly all the super traits, in particular you know, for the standard model. Test. So in the standard model, you know uh, how the mass depends on the on the value of the of the X field. Uh -huh. so you know exactly those mass matrix, so you can compute this trace, this super trace, uh -huh. and you obtain directly the same. Uh, and this super trace is going to be just like in a combination of these masses? Okay. Yeah, because in here this is already let's see, when you have diagonalized the mass matrix. And this numbers that comes the, the number of degrees of freedom. Let's say so, so the W, so you have mm. W plus and W minus, and you have free polarization because it's like what? Because it's massive vector. Right? So that counts the number of degrees of freedom to the W. The same for the Z, you have free polarization. Uh, for the top, so there is a color factor. Mm. The top exists in three colors. And um, you have the top left and the top right, and each top left and top right actually correspond to, to two degrees of freedom. Oh. The term not just two degrees of freedom. Because of the way. Uh, because of the degrees of freedom. You and I. Uh, no, it's, it's just a fermion representation. So when you're trying to solve the Dirac equation, you have this, uh, this U and V. Component of the Dirac factor. So that's exactly what this factor to be. This is the mass of the X boson and this is the mass of the bosons. So maybe, yeah, I don't know, there's various things that you can do. Either you compute this integral, straightforward integral, let's say, with the integral. Or you, you, you may want to compute explicitly the super trace. Okay. Okay, so let's see. So let's try to compute the super trace. Right? So as I say, the mass of the various particles depends on the background value of the X. Right? So you know this expression, for instance, the mass of the X, the mass of the W is one quarter G squared times V squared. So here uh, v you have to replace by the background value of the x. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's only in the true minimum that x and h will be equal to v. Yes. So this is our, this are the standard formula. You know, for the mass of the z, the mass of the w. So there is no issue. The only uh, non-trivial thing is actually to count and to look at the mass of the x and the mass of the both. So. so. Something like this. Energy will be the same? No. Momentum. Yeah, so, so you say that you, you see that here the momentum disappears when you do the integral, right? 
So here is the super trace, so it's only a super trace of the mass metric. There is no momentum dependency. So somehow this k, you know, gives you lambda squared. So there is a piece which is lambda to the four. But we just count the number of degrees, the number of particles. It's a super trace of the identity. So it gives you one for each degree of freedom which is bosonic, minus one for each degree of freedom which are fermionic. So that's a to the four, lambda to the four, but that doesn't depend at all on the value of the x field. So this is just a constant to the potential. So it's just a correction to the cosmological constant. And that's what you all know, that the cosmological constant actually is quadratically uh, divergent, uh, quartically divergent. So you get a correction to the cosmological constant that goes like lambda to the four. In particular, if lambda is a Planck scale, you get a correction which is 120 order of magnitude larger than what is when than what it is observed experimentally. That's what is called the cosmological constant. One of the greatest problems, right? Maybe. But then the next term, we are completing this integral is just a super trace of the mass matrix. So that's what will give you, you no know, correction. Uh, a correction to the mass, because, okay, the mass are proportional to h, so m squared has a, a piece which is proportional to h squared, so effectively this piece will give you, you know, as a function of h, will be a, a function which is proportional to h squared, so this is a correction to this mass. <laughs> so that's what we want to compute. I don't know really understand how we're going to integrate this. So I don't know. I mean, either you know, we can go from here to here, or we can go from here to there. Up to you. Non this is pure mathematics. This is a little bit of physics. Maybe let's begin with mathematics because I really don't understand what. It sounds like very simple, but I. Don't see maybe what this function is like. And how it's supposed to be integrated. So here there is no integral, right? No, so no. here to there, the integral is already one. No. I want to understand how no. to integrate. Oh, okay, okay. So you first. How to take the integral. Yes. Okay. So maybe I can help you. Yes. Okay. 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 So, I mean, that's very similar to, uh, to the loop integral that we did this morning, or this afternoon. Um, so, it's an integral of uh, a Klingon space. So, d for k. So, it's 2 pi squared for the integral of a Klingon. K e u. Ke over two pi to the fourth, and then you have a super trace of the log of Ke plus m squared. So that's a normal integral, right? And then, okay, this integral is in principle quartically different divergent simply because you have Ke and the log. So this is a normal integral, right? But okay, you need maybe to put in Mathematica or whatever you want to do the computation. Can we move super trace to the left side? Well, you have to be careful because it depends on the on the momentum, right? So at the end, it's like doing integral key x, x cube, um, so the trace, you can move large x squared, right? Plus, plus y squared. <laughs> That's what you have to compute. Okay, so now, I don't know. People used to know all this integral by Earth. People use this super trace. Uh, yeah. Maybe just Yes, <laughs> 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 
is just uh, yeah. just matrix right? so you can for instance you can go um, to a basis where all the mass matrix are diagonalized mm -hmm. the super trace is just basically the sum over um, over the sorts of the bosons of i uh, sum of the boson with the mass uh, with the bigger masses minus the sum over the fermion in the bigger Basis. So you shouldn't be afraid of the super trace. So the super trace really factorizes it. You can you know, super trace in front of it. Super trace is just basically doing the sum in the, in the diagonal basis. And then we have to think about it. So that's basically what is written in the equation. And you can recognize all the pairs. So you have lambda 4, the super trace of identity. Yes. That's the first time that was written there. Um, then y is just a mass, right? So it will be lambda squared times m squared. So super trace of m squared. Um, and that's it. And the other, the other piece is yes, uh, super trace of m to the 4 times log of lambda lambda squared. Yeah, yeah it's slightly written in the page. You can rewrite the same thing. Oh. It agrees with what this So that, that's the idea, right? Yeah. So really simple so you transform this with scary integral into into this simple and very clear. Usual integral of one variable. Yeah. Okay. So now, so now the idea is really that, you know, what, so that's the correction to the x potential, mm -hmm. and now you need to identify what are the pieces that will give the correction to the x mass, right? So if you, if you remember that all the masses in the standard model are linear in h, it means that the super trace will be quadratic in h squared. So this will give you a piece which goes like h squared times the coefficient in front of it. So this piece is a correction to the x mass. Yes. And we see that this correction to the x mass is proportional to lambda squared. So this means that the quantum correction to the x mass is quadratically diverged. Mm -hmm. And now we just want to compute explicitly this coefficient. Rate. So for that, you need to look indeed at the spectrum of the standard model as a function of the background field. So here it's clear, there is no subtlety. And maybe the thing that you want to compute is actually what is the mass of the x and what is the mass of the ghost stone for the value of the x field, which is away from the vacuum expectation. Okay. And we'll want to do it like lectures. 
So how did we compute the x mass, you know, in the standard model? You remember uh, the x mass of strong potential? Yes. We have a uh, term with lambda and h you know, h four three. Mm -hmm. And then we replace one square to square, and from here we get mass. Yes? Yes, yes. I mean, at the end of the day, you are expanding the potential, the potential around the minimum. Mm -hmm. yes. And then the quadratic piece in the mid <coughs> was corresponding to, to the mass. Mm. So that's something you can do. Okay, maybe I can do it for you. It's slightly. Okay. I can do it. So, okay, so you have the x, and now you say, okay, the x was to be plus h, so maybe not to avoid the confusion, be zero. I I want so that's that's the physical exposure that's and it says ghost mm -hmm. and here is the same phi two plus phi phi three but it is good. <coughs> and then you can read the mass simply by looking at the quadratic dependence in the field so quadratic dependence in phi zero phi one phi two phi three by expanding this potential. It's easier first to compute this and then we take the squared later. Ah, skip this part. Oh, okay. The same result that we need to find the book. Okay. Such a 
Plus, so the quadrat is clever. This is a Lagrangian, so now you can read off really what are the mass to the different fields. Zero is or y, so two lambda h square plus h lambda h square minus lambda h square, and we have three lambda h. Yeah, square minus minus square. And this is yes. And this is four one square R H square minus V square. Just like this. So you notice that of course if you go back to the vacuum, so when H is equal to V. This turns the mass zero. of the ghost on goes to zero, yes. as expected. And goes this, to lambda this, this agrees with the result that we found in the vacuum. And that's all the task? Yeah, so now you have the spectrum, you know, you have the general spectrum as a function of the background field for H. So now the only thing that you need to compute is this super trace. Scale, scale, scale. <laughs> no, you shouldn't be scared. Yeah, right? Super trace of m squared is what the mass, mass the mass of the w mm -hmm. as a function of h, right? Mm -hmm. And then the super trace counts the number of degrees of freedom, so I see that you have factor six plus a factor three for the mass of the z for the function of h plus mass of square. Uh, uh, minus, minus, 12. 12. Minus, minus 12. Minus 12. Minus 12 for the mass of the top squared as a function of x plus, plus, mass of x. plus the mass of x plus the mass of x 1, right? Plus the mass, <laughs> mass of phi 0, zero. plus, plus okay, the mass of phi 1, phi 2, phi 3. 3 mass of okay, 3 mass of phi i. Also, as a function of the background value. Yeah, okay. So you need just to compute the same. So now what you notice is that the mass. Okay. So the mass of the W as a function of the X, let's say it's one quarter G squared H squared. H squared right? yeah. Which you can say is simply one quarter g squared, v squared, and h squared divided by v squared. And here you recognize from all the mass of the w squared in the vacuum. Right? So you can put a zero here. Mm. And then you better write this way. And then yeah. it. Yes. Indeed, you cannot exactly do the same the yeah. same thing because this. this doesn't really work for the x. Nonetheless, okay. So you have one piece, you know, that depends only on h squared, and one piece which is independent of h. Right? Mm -hmm. So this gives you again a correction to the cosmological constant. Mm -hmm. It's a piece which is independent on the value of h. Right. So then you need to collect all the pieces that depends on h squared. So it's three. So it's six. So wait. By summing this, right, we give you a contribution which is 6 lambda h squared. Right? Something that you can rewrite as 6 uh, 3 <coughs> times the mass of the x is 0 
in the backyard. H squared divided by D squared. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, six from yeah, here. From here. Well, three? I already summed the two, right? Yes. Uh, three plus three, six. Mm -hmm. Because here. Yeah. Square. Plus a constant. Right? This plus a constant that you don't care. Oh, okay. You don't care because it does, I mean, it's a constant That's in the potential, right? But ah. it's a correction to the cosmological constant. Yes, right. So that's it, right? So we get you know, a correction to the x potential, which is quadratic uh, in the x, and yeah. everything here will be multiplied by lambda squared, right? So what we have computed is this piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah. <coughs> so it's a correction to the x mass, which is quadratic in lambda squared. <coughs> and we found you know, this particular combination of. Um, and what about uh, mm -hmm. coefficients? Well, the coefficient you have it here, right? 6 mw plus 3 mz mm -hmm. minus 12 m top plus 3 mh. Mm -hmm. So we factorize this factor 3, that's factor 2, factor 1, factor 4 for the top mm -hmm. with a minus sign, right? Minus, uh, minus sign is due to the super trace, plus this factor 1. And you know, the only subtleties is really this factor 3, right? Because naively you would have said, okay, I, I am using the mass of the x, right? Not the mass that I've computed here. So if you are using the mass of the x in the vacuum, you will say, okay, it's mass of the x squared, which is uh, mass of the x zero, h squared over v squared. But we have seen that instead of having factor one here, you, have a, you need this factor three, right? Mm -hmm. And this factor three is really the combination of the goldstone away from the vacuum. Right? Yes. So this explains why you have really this factor, uh, this rel relative factor here, one, the same factor for the z and the x, while if you have done it naively, you will have a factor one third. And this is a result that agrees with the loop computation. So really the important thing was to, to compute correctly this factor in front of the, the x. That's I mean, the only non-trivial piece which you can call it for the exercise that you have just done. Right. And that means that we are in this second is B. Well, uh, well, I mean, this this is one and uh, not three. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, one is, is the same, the fact factor, as, as we have computed this morning with uh, yeah. the loop integrals, so yeah. with the Feynman diagrams, we, we have found this result. Mm -hmm. And now we we found a nice, simple other derivation just by looking at the spectrum of the particle without having to compute every time all these Feynman diagrams. So this is much easier because you know that's easy to, to put in your computer. You have the mass matrix, just diagonalize the mass matrix and compute directly the quadratic divergence. The only subtleties was really this, this factor that I mean, you can get wrong very easily. So I wanted to show you how to get it right. Okay. That's really the non trivial part. Oh, the other are trivial. The only thing is this one. The question is numerically, it nearly doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But it's not It will matter, of course, if you do you know, some. Uh, some MSSN, for instance, yeah. you want to know exactly what is the lambda square dependent. So that you need to get the coefficient exactly right. Okay? Yeah. So that's maybe the first example of your life where you're dealing with a background field method. It's it's things that you can generalize for, for gauge field also. You can do some loop computation via this background field method. Avoid, you know, to compute explicitly some Feynman diagrams, which is purely analytical, purely algebraic. So it's somewhat, it's somewhat hidden. 
on the computation of human viable potential is done by human and wife. So, so people are computing for you all yeah. these stupid uh, ten man rules for one in their life, and then you don't need to know them anymore in your life. You can just apply this method. That's it. Thanks. In fact, the original idea of the equipment requirement was that they wanted somehow radiatively to, to get the minimum right chance. Because it would be a beautiful idea. But it didn't work. This day, right? no. Good. So, any other exercise that you would like to solve or question here in the computation? No. I can try to show uh, the cancellation of uh, anomalies. Yes, yeah. sure. So you want to do it in the standard model, or you want to start adding the right hand in the trio? No, let it be in the standard model. Okay. So maybe you should first start um, with a table of all the quantum numbers of the particles, no? Mm. I don't so actually remember them. I don't <laughs> remember them either, but you need to derive them. We'll think a little closer. OK. OK. Uh, there are two uh, anomaly diagrams. Waves. Uh, the problem is uh, they make uh, our theory not renormalizable, uh, uh, so our only hope is uh, to cancel these diagrams out. And in your cases, we have something like, something like that. Uh, this is the a generator of the corresponding group to which, uh, from which this boson. Uh, and it, it, it turns out that these diagrams several situations, uh, depending on uh, which boson uh, goes to the vertex. Uh, let's uh, draw a table. What are those different lines? Mm. Yes. Okay. To one group. Mm -hmm. Yes. of which bosons uh, goes into this uh, triangle. Inside of it we have the standard model fermions. Yeah. And here bosons from the possible variants of groups. It could be three uh, SU3, three SU3 uh, bosons. Okay. So and, uh, it's a number of possibilities. 
Thank you. Uh, uh, the first uh, variant. Uh, as we know, is uh, uh, quantum from dynamics is not parallel uh, theory. Uh, left and right fermions uh, interact uh, in the same way, so uh, we can uh, say from the beginning that this sum will be zero. Check. Uh, if we have uh, one SU2 and one SU3, this uh, uh, diagram will be proportional to uh, trace of Pauli uh, matrices or uh, Or uh, uh, Gelman matrices. And this uh, is equal to zero, so we can see that this variance here will have insulation to uh, mm -hmm. this.
QED is vector like series. There is no anomaly for QED. Only curl series. It's not the electric car, it is with this hyper sharp vector. Charge for Maybe I can draw you. I mean, you can do yes, it together so you have to charge it from field in the standard model. That may be one thing that we should have started to discuss right away what is the particle content of the standard model. So you have the quark doublet, the left hand doublet, you have up right, down right, which is you have the neutrino with the electron, left hand and the right hand with the electron. But the particle content of the star model. So for SU3, SU2, and U1 triplet charm. So this is triplet, 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 singlet, singlet. This is doublet, singlet, singlet, doublet, singlet. So only not real thing is what is the hypercharge. And well, you know that here, F now, and this has a Q which is equal to Q and this is Q plus minus one curve. And Q is if we left plus hypercharge. So two curves is supposed to be equal to one half plus hypercharge. And hypercharge is equal to one to six. You can say that it works for the that. Minus one third, one half plus minus one half is one to six. The single impact charge is double. Uh, right and now it's easy because it's not more charge than the SU2. So the electric charge is the same as the impact charge. Could you please repeat what you talked about the stable that was 
<laughs> we have these anomaly diagrams, uh, and uh, uh, to the each vertex, one of three uh, each boson can come. Uh, so it would be a three S U three bosons, this variant, the zero S U two and uh, zero U one. The number of gauge bosons. Okay, yes. I can just read. Yes, you three. Yes, you three. Yes, you three. And uh, for example, yes, you two, you one. SU2. That's it. 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 <laughs> For left the particles and to right particles. Yes. In, in each vertex we have a construction like this. Uh, uh, and we should see uh, to the generator uh, of the great module group. For as you do, it, it's uh, um, Pauli matrices. For SU3, it's Gelman uh, matrices. Okay, what, what I was doing? Uh, number, number five. Ah, okay, it's easy to. Uh, for both left and right particles, it's proportional to yeah. Maybe it's a mistake, I just know that it should be zero and I don't want to <laughs> waste time trying to confuse that. Well, okay. uh, uh, so we are computing the okay, sound. This is not the mathematically correct equation. <laughs> 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 Zero. <laughs> okay, back to the number five with three SU two bosons. Mark the one that were not totally triggered, right? So this one are triggered, but this one was not triggered. So you need a relation between the different deeper charges and different quarks to get this yes. relation. This I don't know. It's half trivial. Because it's simple and we have a one more time trace of uh, power matrices. Uh, that is zero. Let it be 
passer en 10. Yes, it's the idea, but uh, they are not zero, so we just uh, say it's proportional to, to what, what is uh, 21. But probably what he's saying is that you shouldn't include particles that are probably neutral under SU2, right? Right. So this means that this sum should be only in Q left and uh, the doublet of it.
No. Only this one and this one. This you shouldn't include because they are neutral on the SU. So this means that it's really it's hypercharge of Q left, which is one of the six, times the polar factor, times three, plus the hypercharge of the doublet, minus one half. Exactly, which is here. Why you don't have two here? Because they are double so you shouldn't. I mean, you can, you can if you want to put the two, but you have also to put for the left. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, so, so it plus plus two yes minus one half squared minus one minus one to the cube yes. And okay, you can check this should be equal to zero. So we have all this. Uh, anybody mathematical or whatever computer in front of you? Check that this should be equal to zero. <laughs> so in, in all these cases, uh, these anomal uh, diagrams have no, no anomalies. No, well, yes, here is no anomaly. So if you think about it, this is, so we have checked somehow that the standard model is consistent with the constellation of anomalies. So all the gate symmetry of the standard model are true symmetry at the quantum level. So the important thing that maybe Gleb will discuss, I mean, those anomalies only appear at the one loop level. So there is only one thing that you need to check, that this anomaly cancel at one loop. If they cancel at one loop, they will cancel to all order in perturbation. That's an important result of anomaly. So that's the only thing that you need to check to make sure that the gauge symmetry are really good symmetry at the quantum level. So we have checked indeed that uh, the charge assignment of the standard model ensures the anomaly constellation. Then you can ask yourself, you know, the reverse constellation, the reverse question, is it the only solution? Could you have all the charges for the quark and the lepton that also ensure anomaly cancellation? This is non-trivial because, as you have seen here, you know, you have a set of um, several equations that are non-linear in the charge, right? Here, it's really the sum of the cube of the charges, so it's a non-linear equation. So, first of all, it was not guaranteed at all that you could find a solution to this equation. And the next question is whether this solution is unique or not. So certainly it's not totally unique because you can always do an overall rescaling of these U1 charges and nothing will change. You know, multiply by an overall factor, all the quark with the same factor, all the quark on the left hand with the same factor, you will always find the same result. And this is again due to the fact that there is no canonical, no canonical normalization for the U1 gauge group, right? All what matters for U1 is always the product of the gauge coupling times the hypercharge. That's only the physical quantity. But of course, you can always you know, change the normalization of the, of the charge, and this will change the normalization of the gauge coupling in such a way that the product is fixed. Right? So that's why you know, some, some books are using Q3 is equal to T3 left plus y, or y over 2, y over 4, they are all correct as long as they don't specify how they, they normalize the hypercharge, this is correct. There's no, no question. really depends on the normalization of the U1, the U1 group. Um, so as I said, I mean, it was not totally trivial that you will find a solution because it's a nonlinear equation. Um, you can check, actually, that all these apparently different conditions, anomaly constellation condition, actually reduce to a single equation, uh, provided that, you know, um, U1 of electromagnetism is vector-like. So here, you know, you have chirality, so SU2 is chiral, U1 is chiral, but it is broken into a subgroup, U1 of electromagnetism, which is vector-like. QED is a vector-like theory. And this is enough, actually, to show that what appears you know, to be a complicated equation with the cube of the, of the charge, actually, using the fact that it has to be broken into a vector-like theory, or the cube will re reduce to a linear equation, let's say, imposing this, uh, this vector-like condition. So that's why, at the end of the day, you do find a solution to this equation, to this equation is because electromagnetism is a vector-like theory. Otherwise, you know, it wouldn't be guaranteed at all that you will find charges you know, of all the quark on the lepton that ensure anomaly constellation. So maybe, you know, there is a, it's a deeper problem that you can think of. 
um, can you have actually unbroken symmetry that are uh, that are chiral? That I don't know. Uh, all the symmetry that we know that survive at the that at the quantum level, you know, uh, that are not spontaneously broken are vector-like. There is no unbroken chiral symmetry in, in the standard model that we know of. I don't know if it's a CRM or not. It seems, it seems that there is good indication that it's, it's possible. So it's a conjecture. We can end here. If you have any other questions of this anomaly, let's thank our director. One, one final remark. So uh, I say here, you know, but this anomaly constellation determine uh, the relative hypercharge, let's say, of the quark versus the hypercharge of the of the electron. For so I say that it's more or less unique up to an overall factor. So you see here that that the charge, okay, which you can you can translate by saying that the charge of the up quark is my is two thirds or minus two thirds the electric charge of the electron. That's a result of this anomaly constellation. This is not a unique solution if you allow yourself to introduce actually uh, the right-handed electron, uh, the right-handed neutrinos. In this case, this ratio is not fixed by anomaly constellation. You can have a different ratio. Still, you will find actually that the electric charge of the proton, you know, which is Two times the electric charge of the up plus the electric charge of the down is has to vanish even in the presence of the right of the neutrinos. So you understand why at the end of the day the proton is electrically neutral. It's just the consequences of anomaly constellation. Yes. Uh, they usually say let's thanks the lecture again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Небольшая просьба тем, кто пользовался авиаэкспрессом, проходите, пожалуйста. Мне кажется, меня так слышно без микрофона нет.